Fasting has become a hot topic in the health and wellness industry thanks to popular diets like keto. But how do you know if fasting is right for you? Do you have to follow the keto diet to see the benefits? Today on the podcast, I had the pleasure of speaking with Phil White, an Emmy-nominated writer and the co-author, along with Dr. Frank Merritt, of the 17-Hour Fast. We dive into the inspiration for writing about the topic of fasting, as well as the benefits that you can have from implementing a minimum effective dose strategy for fasting, while harnessing the powerful health and performance advantages of longer fasts and avoiding many of their pitfalls. This is Performance Theory with Mike Clark. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today, Phil. How's everything going in Colorado? Yeah, good. Um, I'm not sure how much snow you got up there. We got about 18 inches, maybe 20 on the ground. More snow blowing in, my wife told me. So uh, I was like, bloody hell, it dropped like 20 degrees outside. I went to get a package, um, some new espresso, thank the good Lord. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm about out of beans. But uh, yeah, I was like, what happened out here? And she said, oh, you know, look at the forecast. We're getting more snow today and tomorrow. So yeah, same as you, mate, probably. Yeah, getting pretty uh, pretty hammered. Yeah, it actually just dropped temperature here yesterday. Well, in Celsius, it was two above. And then I woke up this morning, it was minus 22. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we get that. She said it was four degrees Fahrenheit when she took the kids. It gets real, bro. <laughs> You've got a new book out, The 17-Hour Fast. What inspired you to write this book? So... I was introduced to to Dr. Frank Merritt by Brian McKenzie while we were writing Unplugged, and we ended up featuring um, Frank in that book. And just when I heard, we just got the talk in one day about stuff not related to to what he was kindly contributing to Unplugged. And uh, he told me why he started this um, this company, Vitality Pro, on the side, because he's board certified in internal medicine. He runs um, emergency medicine for a hospital down in Panama City Beach, Florida. So he's a pretty busy fella. But um, he started this company um, because his his friend, his best friend, Jason, seven about seven and a half, eight years ago, was diagnosed with the worst form of brain cancer and given a maximum of six months to live. And that didn't sit too well with Frank and some of the other doctors in the community. So this kind of cross-discipline team got together and figured out some things that they could do for him. And Frank's main contribution to that was to, to figure out a minimum effective dose with fasting that obviously when you're battling cancer and particularly an aggressive kind of cancer like this, like calorie depletion is a worry. And so they, they didn't want to try anything, you know, any of the longer fasts. And they realized that he his body couldn't handle daily intermittent fasting. And really what Frank settled on in his research was this 17 hour minimum effective dose bookended by smaller what he calls pre fast meals and post fast meals. So you kind of have a um, this on and off ramp where you're not creating this massive delta between eating a normal size meal or even a big meal because you're worried you're going to have to fast and then coming out of it and being like, oh, I'm starving, so I'll eat a big meal there. So in doing so, uh, the 17 hours purely fasted and then smaller pre and post meals, you're, you're basically getting 70, 80% of the effects of at least a 24 hour fast and probably some of the autophagy and other benefits that you would get with a 36 hour fast. One of the things that constantly gets brought up when we're talking about this topic is, is fasting safe? Mm-hmm. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got a big disclaimer warning because when you're an MD, your career's on the line when you write a book like this. So there's a big disclaimer. Like if you have type one diabetes, you probably shouldn't be doing it. If you have type two diabetes or in that kind of high blood sugar pre-diabetic range, you need to ask a doctor. And to be safe, not just as a CYA, I mean, I would say before you start any exercise program or any diet program, including any kind of fasting, you should check with an MD and preferably one that is board certified in internal medicine. So they know what's going on with your digestive system. They've got your full history there. And there's actually a section of the book where we provide where someone can take that section in or even photocopy it if they don't want a book inside a doctor's office. Um, And the doctor can fill that out and um, just Frank trying to do his due diligence as an MD. So I would say on the most part, yes, we believe it is safe. But again, as as my co-author Andy Galpin always says, it depends. 
because there's always going to be someone with some condition where they do it, something bad happens. And they're like, you said it would be safe. And I'm like, well, no, we didn't read the disclaimer. You, you check with your MD. Yeah, that, that's a good uh, thought for anybody who's thinking of fasting. Now, was this your first exposure to fasting or had you done it previously? No, I tried um, intermittent fasting for a while. I tried, tried a few longer fasts and it's kind of a hard gainer. You know, I'm 6'2". I'd like to say I'm 6'3 in shoes, maybe 6'4". Um, it's the typical NBA thing, right? Yeah. Um, I could have probably, if I had... My big sporting regret, I played so college soccer and basketball at a small college in Kansas City, but I think if um, rowing wasn't such a class thing in the UK, i.e. if you're not rich and you don't go to Eton or Harrow and then on to Oxford and Cambridge, you don't row typically, I would have been an okay um, uh, lightweight rower and I probably could have cut be, be, below that weight limit. So I, my big concern with fasting was always, well, man, I struggled to, to put on muscle and maintain it anyway. So a, again, like with Jason, um, you know, with Frank, where they didn't do daily IF and they didn't do longer fasts with him, obviously cancer is a way more severe problem than being a hard gainer, but that was my concern. But Frank kind of walked me through that and he was like, basically we're talking about we're missing one meal a week. So just from a sheer numbers standpoint on total calorie input, I doubt you're going to lose muscle or struggle to build a bit of lean muscle if your, your lifting protocol is the right, designed the right way. And, um, and so it proves. And actually, some of the research shows that there's a spike in human growth hormone of up to 2,000% um, that can accompany a controlled, again, minimal effective dose in fasting. So it's not like it's going to be like certain baseball players we won't mention in injecting HGH in their butt before, you know, a practice or a lifting session. It's nothing yeah. going to be like that. But there is a there is a certain hormonal effect and, and largely a positive effect on the HGH side. When Jason followed this protocol and did the 17 hour fast, am I correct in saying he lived an additional six years past his diagnosis? A lot of times with this kind of aggressive cancer, when you're going through chemo for this long they say if you're trying to, to have kids, that that is probably not going to happen. But he was able to have two kids. He continued practicing law almost up until the end and was pretty active um, considering how aggressive. And to be honest, on a personal level, the reason this resonated was my father-in-law, John, passed away about a year and a half before I met my wife, Nicole, of the same kind of brain cancer. And they didn't have access. Her family didn't have access to the kind of you know knowledge that Frank and his colleagues have in their head, and he declined way faster. Um, it was a lot rockier road, and you know the thought process of my wife and I was like, well, holy crap! What if your dad had had this? Maybe you wouldn't be able to beat that cancer because once it sets in, you know, it's um, the the situation is pretty serious, obviously. But maybe it, like like Jason, he would have outlived it by a few years and would have got more time with his his wife and kids and friends. So on that, a heart level, this was not a head level like, oh wow, I I think we can make a ton of money off this book. I don't care how much we make. That that's not what it's about. And you know what? That's the point that really resonated with me because my father passed away from uh, small cell lung cancer, mm -hmm. and one of the, the things he regretted was actually doing the treatment because it made him feel so sick. And then he went to a more natural treatment um, and he lived an additional six months. Unfortunately, it wasn't six years, but it was a vitamin, high dose vitamin C treatment. And had we known about fasting, you know, maybe that could have extended him even a little bit longer past that point. Because from my perspective, he passed away June 2nd and his first grandchild, my daughter, was born July 23rd. So he missed her by about six weeks. And that's always been a big thing for me is, especially with the cancer thing, is how could we help people feel better, uh, more naturally, and not feel sick due to the chemo? Or if you're getting chemo, as far as I've been doing the research, is the fasting will help any of the ill effects of the chemo as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really sorry to hear about about his passing. That's um, yeah, it's rough, man. But that that's you know you you can't go back, but you can go forward and get the information out to somebody else. So if they're thinking of you know what I'm going through cancer, you know what fasting's free. 
they they might as well try it along with the treatments that they're doing. Yeah. And I think you make a really key point. Like nobody is saying here, do the 17 hour fast or 16, eight or whatever your daily intermittent, you know, longer fast twice a week, you know, don't eat two days a week. And, and that's going to replace your traditional treatment because that would be, I'm not an MD, Frank is, but that would be irresponsible. And, um, we all know those BS claims floating around the health and wellness first. Right. So yeah, I'm glad you, glad you added that caveat because yeah, Jason did undergo all of the the traditional chemo, some experimental treatments as well while while doing the fasting. But yeah, to your point, I mean, it definitely does certain types of cancer. It does starve those cancer cells of glucose, which is the fuel they use. And um, obviously, you know, list, I would advise people to listen to the multiple parts of the Tim Ferriss podcast that Don Diagostino is on because he you know, is a straight up baller in this area. And, and I had the pleasure of interviewing Dom for an on it story last year um, on ketogenesis and alcohol. He was very, very generous, gave me time. He'd literally just got back in the house from a long road trip and gave me almost an hour on the phone before he plugged back in with his family. And yeah, not only a, a great human being, but also at the forefront of this research. So if anyone's curious about, um, you know, how, how this starvation of those cancer cells works, how it can halt that in certain cancers um, and slow it in others. Check out Dom's work and, and particularly that multi-part. There's hours of great info with Tim Ferriss on, on that particular topic. That's something definitely I'll have to check out a little bit more of. Outside of just helping w- treat cancer, what are some of the major benefits that we can see that are measurable for fasting? Yeah. So, I mean, a good example, obviously the story resonated on a personal level with my mother-in-law having lost her husband to brain cancer now almost 20 years ago. But um, she was in the the pre-diabetic range and really knocking on the door of type 2 diabetes. And sure, she's cut back on some sugary snacking, um, although she would admit she still snacks pretty often. But her blood sugar now, having done the the 17-hour fast weekly since the I think it was like two weeks before the book came out she started it so just those two changes cutting down on on sugary snacks and doing the fast um once a week and she hasn't been my mother-in-law she hasn't missed a week she's checking them off you know her blood sugar went down from that high range back into a a normal range that isn't at risk of crossing over into two type 2 diabetes and we've heard numerous anecdotes from family, friends, other readers who've contacted Frank or I through our websites. And uh, so there's that anecdotal evidence that it moves the needle on um, insulin resistance, blood sugar um, levels. But then also, I think when even in the endurance community, say, you know, coaches all all ply people with gel gels and goos, and you know, remind them that they, we we all carry a limited supply of glycogen. And if you're cycling up a bloody mountain as fast as you can for hours at a time, obviously you're going to deplete those stores. Um, but what we see, and Brian McKenzie has talked about this at length, that a lot of endurance athletes when they stop because now they're still used to this. Man, I got to like put this fuel back into me every 30, 40 minutes they almost go pre-diabetic the moment they retire from competition because there's no longer the output to burn up that glucose. So really what Frank says is that um, you're retraining your liver and your pancreas. And, you know, people talk a lot about metabolic flexibility, and I think they take that a little bit too far because there's always going to be gluconeogenesis in play. There's always going to be some degree of ketosis in play. It's like with the energy systems, right? Like recently I heard a coach – explain the energy systems that's going back to the rowing thing of there's three boats and those three boats are always in the race. It just happens at different points that one pulls ahead and another drops back and another drops back a bit further. And then as the race progresses, they change their order. And I thought, man, that's one of the best analogies I've ever heard. And I think that, um, the two main ways that the body produces energy from food and food store or fuel stores is the same way. Like this, this notion that, you're going to switch over to ketosis full time is farcical and it, it, it just doesn't stand up to examination. And again, I'm not an MD, I'm not board certified, but Frank is. So those parts of the book where we talk about this kind of thing, I feel are legit. So you're basically retraining the liver and pancreas a little bit. And for me personally, selfishly, it just makes me a bit more resilient. So I didn't have the chance to eat lunch. You know, we're at what, 118 mountain yep. time. 
not a big deal. I just I got my my coffee on the go here that you'll see me sipping periodically. I got some water. And I used to panic, though. Like, I, I spend a lot of my days in conversations like this, talking to co-authors like Kelly Starrett, Frank, Brian McKenzie, others, some of the clients I work with. Um, and often they shuffle the deck. I get a text, oh, bro, can we push this an hour? Oh, can't do it today. And then I move others around, you know. And so my my schedule as a, a full-time freelance writer trying to support a family of three is always shifting. And I used to have to have protein bars stashed around my office and in my work bag and almonds and everything else. And now, again, just anecdotally, I'm just more resilient. And, and there isn't that panic there of, oh, crap, there's no way I can fuel the workout. Or there's no way I can fuel this podcast conversation on, you know, no, no food. Well, not so. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I noticed when I started doing more fasting. I was I typically do somewhere between a 16 to 18 hour fast, depending on um, how my day is going. But people typically have been trained to think that we need those three square meals a day. And I used to think that as well. So when I had breakfast, I'd be starving by lunchtime. But funny enough that when I don't eat that breakfast and I do that 17 hour fast or even up to 18 hour fast for myself, I'm actually less hungry than I am first thing in the morning when I've eaten or when I'm getting ready for lunch. And people tend to think that I would have no energy, you'd be, you know, dragging around. I actually found that the fasting gives me an energy boost rather than drag me down. Yeah, it's very true. And I think that um, breakfast is the most important meal of the day came from a an article written by a lady in a publication in about, I believe, 1916 or 1918. And that magazine was run by John Harvey Kellogg of the Kellogg cereal fame. And every campaign since then, post cereal, all of these, even when Postum was trying to sell their disgusting coffee alternative, you know, Oh, and they, they pay doctors to say these things. I mean, are we seeing anything different these days already? Maybe people are paying influencers on Instagram more than they are MDs. I don't know. But it, it's just a marketing myth. But how often did your grandparents tell you that or your parents? Exactly. All the time. Like if you're running late for school, oh, you take this bagel with you. Breakfast. Remember, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And so we create these narratives. And once something like that becomes part of the lingua franca of a generation or multiple generations, it's just accepted, right? Well, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. So like you said, the subtext there is, if you don't eat breakfast, you can't train, you can't compete, your cognitive performance is going to be shot. And largely, it's a myth. Now, if we're talking, you want to have the best optimal strength and power and speed session that you could possibly have or any of the above, you, you know, there's an argument that if you're looking for that, your your own personal top one or two percent, maybe you shouldn't be fasted. OK, and Andy Galpin could go into more details or plenty of others out there that could. But if we're just talking about every day, you know, whether it's this kind of conversation, it's a work meeting, it's a regular training session. If you're not going for Olympian level performance, you should be just fine if you're coming off the back of or you're in the middle of a fast and. Rogan's had plenty of people on the talk about that ad nauseum who know a lot more than I do. Speaking of skipping breakfast, one of the controversial topics when we talk about uh, fasting is, is coffee allowed? Does it actually break the fast or do you continue with the fast and drink the no, coffee? I, I mean, it's an ergogenic aid. So, I mean, coffee or tea both are. So, yeah, they're always going to be the purists, aren't they? They're the people that, like, if you post a picture of whatever espresso beans you like online, they're going to tear them apart and tell you all the reasons they're crap and why what they drink is better because it's mold-free beans. And it's this, it's like, oh, my gosh, or why their, their $300 kettlebell is better than your $70 kettlebell. You know, these kind of people are always yeah. going to find fault. But, I mean, to me, like black coffee or or green tea without any kind of milk or milk substitute in it, that I consider still part of the fast. But yet, I mean, Andy Galpin has said this with his own fasting, that the experience is quite a bit different if it's just a pure water fast. So maybe you experiment or maybe you say, OK, I'm going to have my normal coffee this time when I do it, because the first time 
you don't want the fast to be an unpleasant experience, which is why we kind of have the chapters on there about creating a nice experience, you know, with your significant other or your kids or your friends the night before and go get a massage the day of and particularly the first t- couple of times you do it. Because we know if you have an unpleasant experience, say you haven't been to the gym in 10 years, you go in and you try to do like a LeBron James or a Dwayne The Rock Johnson workout your trainer slays your soul, right? Or a certain other company that has soul in the title slays your soul. Yeah. You're very unlikely to come back when you're so sore that you can't walk up or downstairs for a week. And it's the same with the fasting. Why make it harder than it needs to be? So maybe you have your full coffee, normal, you know, again, with preferably no milk or milk substitute, just take it black or water it down. Same with your tea. And then the next time you say, okay, now I'm going to go to 75% of that. Then the next time, 50 percent, 25 percent, zero. And just be your own experiment. If it feels terrible, I don't think there's a problem in reintroducing that caffeine. But occasionally we can't be optimizing all the time. So occasionally go to it. But again, if you have a bad experience with fasting, which is why another reason to write this book, was we hear a lot of people that they've tried daily IF for a couple of months. It feels shitty. You know, Okay, well, there are multiple reasons for that, potentially. The same with this notion that we'll start with 12 hours, then go to 24, then 36. It's not an arms race, right? Like there's no Olympic. You're not making the U.S. Olympic team for fasting. So go gradually. The body de- the body hates a delta, a big delta, which is why we like this kind of on and off ramp with the pre and post meals. Yeah. So, yeah, give yourself your normal coffee, maybe the first two or three times you do it. It'll make it more pleasant experience or tea or whatever. Obviously, you've heard of uh, there is a coffee out there that's going to be putting butter and the MCT oil in there. Now, their their argument is that it doesn't stimulate the insulin release. So technically, it's still fasting. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd have to defer to either Dr. Frank or to someone like Dom Diagostino who actually studies this stuff in a lab to see, because again, not not to to cop out of the question but my level of knowledge is just i'm not a researcher i'm not at that level but i would say i I would stick to black coffee or black or green tea unsweetened no milk substitute because otherwise it's like i don't want to say anything that's going to get me sued yeah (laughs) but it's um i don't know i feel like it it wouldn't be so much of a diminished experience on just regular tea or coffee without those things in it whereas doing it you, again, you can't always be optimizing. So, or, or, or maybe you say, well, okay, well, to be my own experiment, I'm going to try this for three or four weeks, see how it works for me. Because if it works for you a- a- and you're getting most of the benefits, whether you know it or not, tangible and otherwise, well, sure, that's fine. You know, there's a lot of cultures that, that do this, you know, and, and Obviously, Dave Asprey and team have done a good job of bringing this to the masses, but they've been doing this in the Himalayas, and they'll use a yak, a cow, you know, the Vekker ghee, the best kind of ghee that um, companies like Hana um, provide from from a certain the Kerala region in India. That they've seen firsthand that it, um, you know, it, it isn't just Nepal and Tibet that do this; it's India, it's Pakistan. So there is some kind of time tested methodology there that doesn't need to be proven in a lab. But again, yeah, I guess just, just experiment with it. I'm not going to tell anyone they shouldn't do bulletproof coffee. One of the things that I found really interesting is when I first started doing the intermittent fasting, I think it was about a month in. And then one day I just decided, you know what, I'm not hungry. So I actually don't feel the need to eat. So I did, I happened just not to eat that day. And the next morning I woke up, went through my day And long story short, it turned out to be five days of Mm. just a straight fast, and it was completely unintentional. And the only reason I actually broke that fast was because I had a supper meeting. It Honestly, it didn't bug me at all. And that that's something I found really strange and a lot of other people found strange too, is that when you are fasting, you're not necessarily starving for food. And again, perception is reality. If you tell yourself, I'm fasting, so my morning workout is going to suck. Well, guess what? Self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And uh, Scott Carney goes into this, um, the guy that wrote What Doesn't Kill Us. He's a good friend. We're both here in the Denver area. And uh, his his new book, The Wedge, is coming out in a couple of months. And I'll connect you because I think you'd have a really fun conversation. But he... um, He talks about this, just the the placebo and the nocebo effect. 
and it's it's very if you if you can conceive of a problem so this is the nocebo effect right yeah. in action it yeah it's going to suck you have to go into a big work meeting and present to your bosses you know either to try to secure a promotion or prevent yourself from getting fired oh man i didn't eat you know this bloody fast thing i hate this you go in with that attitude well guess what your presentation is going to bomb you're not getting your promotion you or you'll probably get fired on the other end so yeah we, we become what we behold and also we um that self-talk piece is really huge so just tell yourself i'm gonna have a pleasant experience maybe like i said get a massage have a date night with your wife or your spouse or your girlfriend boyfriend whatever um take time to play with your kids maybe even combine it stack it as katie bowman would say behavioral stacking with a technology fast so that you truly unplug from technology and you truly plug in with the people you care about and, and just make it a fun family evening um just create conditions for success, I guess, is what I'm saying. What have you guys found in the book um, as the optimal schedule for the fast? So is there between a certain time to a certain time that most people should be fasting? Yeah, and obviously, like if you start to get into Michael Bruce's stuff on chronobiology, this might want to you might want to shift this if you're a dolphin, you know, or you're a lark or whatever it is. But um, what Frank recommends typically is to eat dinner between five and six. And then, obviously, I'm not very good at math, but obviously go, say, then from a 6 p.m. finish round the clock to when you hit 17. And, and you know, he's he's not very funny about the numbers. Just like Brian McKenzie says, if timing your breath holds or each phase of your breath stresses you out, then you're probably doing the exact opposite of what it's meant to be doing, which is putting you into parasympathetic recovery. So stop timing it. Just guesstimate. So like you said, okay, you do a 16 hour fast one day, you know, or or one week, the next one you do 18, the next one you do 17 and a half. It doesn't matter as long as you're in, you you know, and you can progress to it. Maybe you think 17 seems like a weird number or it's too long. Go for 10, go for 11. Maybe you just cut out your evening snack that night and you eat breakfast as normal the next day. Try to build up a little bit. So if you're going to 14 and a half, you're going to 15, 16, you're still going to be getting some of the benefits, kind of similar to anytime someone asks me about contrast therapy, you know, and I've worked with XPT, led Hamilton's company extensively, um, Brian McKenzie on some of this stuff. Okay, the idea of an ice bath is horrible. We'll just take a warm bath followed by one minute in a cold shower. And the research shows you're going to get a pretty big percentage of the benefits of that sauna ice bath combo. Same with the fasting. Try a little bit. Maybe increase it a little bit. Maybe you increase it and it feels terrible. Dial it back again because you, your physiology is very similar to mine, but yet we're all different. So be your own experiment. Try it and just go. Same with sleep, you know, changing your sleep routine, your sleep patterns. Try what works best for you. And it may take years of experimentation, but eventually I think you're going to hit hit a pretty good sweet spot. And does that go the same for like how many days a week that you should be going? So, you know, if you can't handle seven, but you can handle three solid days of fasting, that's better than not fasting at all? Well, for us, really with the 17 hour fast, we're talking once a week. Now, oh. Frank and I do it more often than that. Yeah. But it, we're saying one 17 hour fast per week. Start there. And in fact, maybe you just stay there. Like we're, in the book, we don't say, OK, do, do that once and then next week go for twice a week, three times a week and suddenly every day. That's not what we're advocating. We're truly going for a minimum effective dose again to kick off autophagy like we talked about, which is the the clearing out of dead cell matter and to use decaying cell matter to use to create new cells. I mean, that's something that gets put into hibernation mode if you are. Um, in a fed state all the time. And also, if you look at Rhonda Patrick's work, it's also something that can be affected when your cold shock and heat shock proteins aren't activated by being in hot and cold. So that's the reason to look into contrast therapy. Um, But then again, retraining the liver and pancreas. And again, we're talking little percentages. But if, you know, Team Sky with um, the cycling really took the marginal gains thing, to, to the nth degree, you know, athletes are traveling with the, their own pillowcase. They're they're not doing this. They're doing that. All these tiny little tweaks from the external environment perspective, customized heat molded shoes. Or you're seeing this in, even in hiking boots now. Well, what if instead of doing all that stuff, you first take care of the big rocks? So you look at your nutrition and hydration. You look at your sleep. 
you look at your movement quality and frequency, you do some daily mobility, you become more conscious of your breath. And you just look at these things, which um, everyone from the folks I've mentioned to Kelly Starrett to Brett Bartholomew and Kenny Kane and some of these other great coaches have been talking about for years. And you're going to find massive percentage gains in performance and recovery from those things. And then once you've got the big rocks out of the way, then start to worry about tweaking other things. But I think that as part of your nutrition and hydration strategy, experimenting a little bit um, it, with fasting is probably a good way ahead. And hopefully we give people a pretty accessible blueprint that's actually written by an MD, not by an Instagram influencer that's trying to make a bit of money off of a hot topic. Yeah, and I think that's important to point out is that everybody is different as well. So there is no cookie cutter formula. Like my my biology is going to be different than yours and you might respond the best to one or two days of fasting, whereas it, me, it might take four days to receive the same effects depending on your biology, correct? Absolutely. Now, coming out of a fast or going into a fast, is there anything particular that you should be eating? Well, again, what we're advocating here is kind of a progressive approach. So we're saying, you know, maybe the first couple of weeks you do it, you go for 75% portion size and calorie total of what you normally would. And no one's saying you should be measuring your beans or your bloody flour or whatever, your, your oats, whatever you're putting in your your pre and post meals. But uh, we're not Lance Armstrong, you know, but um, it's... Uh, so if you start there and then eventually you cut down to 50% portion size. And again, the reason for that is so that you're not creating a delta where you have this massive meal, you have the absence of food and you bookend it with another massive meal. Because again, the, the body doesn't like a delta. And then we're saying, well, having done that, and again, sci fairly scientific approach from Frank, I can take no credit from one variable at a time, right? So then maybe start trying to get the carb percentage in those pre and post meals down. And eventually we, he wants you to hit about 20%. Because again, we're trying to nudge you toward ketosis a bit more. So, you know, your avocados, your nuts, um, maybe some some lean meats, fish, this kind of thing that's, um, you know, a good source of healthy fats is a good protein source. Um, so eventually you're, you're, you're getting down to that kind of 20% carbs and you're cutting out all refined carbs. So just pure sugar, um, maybe some of the fruits that are a bit higher in, in sugar, you know, like watermelon and such, even though those have their place. Um, and so eventually, yeah, you're, you're reducing this portion size for the pre and post meals and you're cutting the, the carb percentage in those meals to, uh, to around 20%. But that could be a gradual thing. You could do that over the course of six months. It doesn't have to be this hard and fast. Because again, if you create a dramatic shift from what you're normally eating, it, it's going to create a more unpleasant experience. And that means we know from behavioral psychology, you're less likely to stick to it. And, and to like a workout routine, like positive behavior changes in your, your marriage or your relationship with your kids, um, your friends, whatever, you know, better work habits. We know that these progressive step-by-step -step things that are more reasonable and less radical typically have more staying power. Keto is a been a big thing lately in the news. It's been kind of the big fad way of eating, but a lot of people have a lot of problems staying on it because they go from a 60% carb intake and keto, you want to drop down to about five. And that's too big of a swing for most people. And, you know, maybe they'll stay on it for a week, but then they fail. Aiming for something like the 20% is reasonable. I mean, that's still a lot of carbs per day. I, I'm not full keto anymore. I did it for about three years, and now I'm mm. balancing around the 15 to 20%, depending on the day. I don't really limit myself like I did on the ketogenic diet. You know, if I have a banana and I want a banana, I eat it. Will it bump up my carbs a bit? Yes, but I don't really like taking things away from myself either. Yeah, and I think too that if you look at the benefits um, of the prebiotics in, in bananas and the fact that they're a resistant starch, the same with potatoes, the same with sweet potatoes. And, and a lot of these experts now on gut health are saying, hey, before you go full prebiotic and probiotic supplements, maybe you should look at your fruit and veggie intake and your, your fiber intake. And maybe sprouted grains aren't actually the devil. And, you know, even sprouted beans and things like this. And, um, 
you know, I, I like really like, I think it's a Canadian company. I think it's called Red Hill Bakery is the bread we get from natural grocers is a good one. Um, obviously, Ezekiel is is one you can find in the frozen section of Whole Foods or any of those stores. So, um, yeah, and even I think I read a story on The Atlantic a couple of weeks ago, and I'm not sure how old it was, but they analyzed the um, – the CFU count in so you know typically what we use to measure the the activity level in probiotics in an apple and it was way higher than any probiotic I've ever seen on there. Now there was a caveat that a lot of those are found in the core, so the discussion then becomes, well, do you blend the whole bloody apple? Well, then there's that chemical in the core that some people say is a is a poison or at certain levels is, and so you know you get into all these discussions. But the point being. Again, start with the basics, okay? If you're looking at new, your nutrition, even my 10-year-old said the other day, he um, he's our Lego master builder in re- residence. That's kind of his hobby. And he's been building these Lego vending machines. And he wanted me to buy him Starburst at the store specifically for, not to eat, and he isn't snacking on it on the side, I promise you. But just vending machine, you put money in, Starburst comes out. with This crazy kid, you know, is way smarter than me. But... He, he brought the packet to me and he was like, I can't pronounce this, this or this. So there's no way I'm going to be snacking on these when I'm building it. And that's just something that my wife and, and I have tried to, we're not Nazis about it. You know, we'll have ice cream at birthdays and if somebody's offering something at another kid's birthday party, our, ours get invited to. We're not going to be like, you thou shalt not, because otherwise you just, that Puritanism, they'll be go crazy when they leave the house. But common sense, if you can't pronounce it and it's a, obviously made in the lab, try not to eat it very often, you know, and just start with the basics. So that story in the Atlantic really reminded me of that fact. And then what you said about a banana, people look at the sugar and, oh, it's too high in sugar. Well, that's not paleo, bro. That's not keto. But is it necessarily bad for you? I have problems with diets that tend to demonize any real, like, I guess, natural or organic food. We know that processed food isn't great for you. Yet there's companies like Beyond Meat that are trying to get you to eat this, their processed food and saying it's healthier than eating regular meat. But then if you take a look at the ingredients in Beyond Meat, just like you said, I can't pronounce half the ingredients in it. So why am I going to eat something like that? Yeah. And shout out to Mark Sisson and Brad Kearns and the team at Primal. And I have no business relationship with these guys. But even I noticed, or I think my wife was like, the hell is canola oil doing in this organic mayonnaise that I bought from Whole Foods? And I was like, all right, I'm going to natural grocers tomorrow anyway, put primal mayo on there. And you know, the spicy one particularly, that's money on a sandwich. Um, But yeah, they sneak it in, even if it's labeled organic or non-GMO, it doesn't always mean a whole lot. And even if you look at say the antioxidant count of wild harvested blueberries, it's up to double that of cultivated organic blackberries or blueberries. So if you can get wild harvested, great. But, you know, everyone's doing the best they can. And I recognize that not everyone can afford or can justify a second mortgage at health food stores. So like you said, go for the basics, avoid the foods on the dirty dozen list, avoid processed where you can. But I think what the problem is that people, even recently watching the last season of The Man in the High Castle, and this is an extreme example, so I don't want to compare Nazis to food Nazis, but I'm about to. People, there's something hardwired in our biology where we're not programmed to be moderate. And whether it's a certain health and fitness regime that you follow and you become, it almost becomes a cult. You've got to have the approved shoes, the approved equipment from this one brand, whatever it is, whatever they say goes. Even if you're you're falling apart from injuries, you're like, dang, I've got to stick with it, you know, because I'm in, I'm all in. Um, or it's food, or it's, you know, there's so much division, or it's politics, there's so much division in the Western world, especially, that food can become another one, right? It's in groups and out groups, paleo, keto, vegan. It's, um, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 like any kind of other intolerance, once it becomes, and JP Sears does the best job of lampooning all yes. of this in his videos because he makes fun of everyone, you know, on all sides. But once it becomes a thing where, I'm virtuous and I'm in my in-group because I do this and I do not do that. And you're bad because you do do that. And and the do's and don'ts are reversed. We're just, we're majoring in the minors at that point. 
In your research for this book, did you find that there's a lot of people that tend to go to the extremes on the fasting and possibly fast for longer than they should? And the reason I ask this is because I did have one client that I was doing intermittent fasting. He was trying to lose weight. And so he tried it and he was up around the 15, 16 hours, which he was doing really well on. And a couple of weeks later, he's losing a lot of weight. And then he approached me and he said, you know, I'm only eating maybe once a week now. I have one meal a week and trying to get him to go back to more of an intermittent schedule was very, very tough. I know. And cause it eventually the prolonged fast he was, and he was doing this for months on end is, you know, Sunday night he would eat and then he wouldn't eat till the next Sunday night. Now, quite honestly, I don't know how he did that. Um, cause even though I fast quite a bit, that would That'd be a little too extreme for me. Did you guys find a lot of people taking it to that extreme? As an N of one, me, I found that I liked the feeling of not eating. And as I mentioned, days where, I mean, when I wrote Game Changer with Fergus Conley, we were on the phone five, six, seven hours a day some days in the thick of that, which if you've seen the size of that book, uh, you'll know why. And um, I started going way beyond to like the 18, 20 hour mark almost daily and i started shedding weight whereas when i course corrected and i went back to then not fasting at all for a while and then just doing the weekly 17 hour fast and now i do it two to three times a week i would say but yeah i I like the feeling i was like man i'm fine i'll just caffeinate and i'll just blitz through and i get to five o'clock and my wife's like do you make an omelet or something earlier and i was like nope she's like well can you come help me with dinner now so I was miss, missing at least breakfast and lunch those days and then pushing all the way through the afternoon. And again, I was doing that six or seven days a week and it was too much of a good thing. And I was, I got down to like, man, like somewhere in the one sixties and my fighting weights like 188, 190. And people started to know, my wife said that I was starting to look like McConaughey, you know, at Dallas Buyers Club before he yeah. put the weight back on. And that she was like, that's, that's, I prefer buff McConaughey to skinny McConaughey and same goes for you, bud. So (laughs) sort yourself out. And then also you see crap on Instagram all the time of people trying to be this badge of courage, you know, like how many hashtag, how many hours they fasted. And again, there's no Olympic team for this. Um, And just because a little bit is good for you doesn't mean that a lot is, uh, a lot is better and a lot more is better still. In fact, once you cross that, that divide, anything can be bad for you. Lifting, taking a walk, you know, anything, if you go to excess. Have you found that the fasting has been able to help people break bad habits with food or bad relationships with food? Yeah. I mean, I think someone like that should get with a professional like yourself or look for, you know, precision nutrition certified, coach to help them because there are or maybe they need even need cog- some cognitive behavioral therapy you know that if there's some psychological issues there or if they've had a history of either anorexia or obesity or anything in between where there's disordered eating i think that that person could probably do with at least an accountability buddy whether that be a friend a, a partner whatever to help them and probably a professional I think that, but even with my mother-in-law's example, like I said, she'll still sometimes say, oh, should I have a bagel? You know, do you want a bagel with that omelet for her house or something? I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure a three egg omelet with cheese and two kinds of veggies and a ton of salsa. I'm pretty good with that, but thank you. Um, So she still somewhat hangs on to that. I need carbs with every meal. But again, just in terms of um, staying at her house for two weeks over, over Christmas break when the kids are off school, I noticed that she does snack less frequently and the choices that she's making now are a lot better. And really the main two habit changes are are less frequency plus better choices. And then the second one being that she's just doing the 17 hour fast once a week. And we can see the impact on that on her blood sugar and her blood sugar stability. You've given us a lot of great information today. And I encourage everybody to pick up their copy of the 17 hour fast. Where can people reach out to you on social media? Sure. So, yeah, social media is a weird thing because um, a lot of people will know Kenny Kane, either from his days as a comedian back in the day or the coach of, uh, coach, head coach of what used to be CrossFit LA and is now Oak Park. So he and I um, 
did a really long social media fast as an experiment. And we wrote a couple of pieces under his byline for Train Heroic on their website. So you can check that out. And really his contention is, look, his job as a coach is to make, like yours, to make people more fit, healthy, and well. Is social media doing that or is it not? And it definitely is not neutral. So now I'm on kind of a reverse fast where I've been back on for two weeks and I pretty much hate it. But I think I'm going to continue periodically on Instagram and quit the other two. So, yeah, just at Phil White Books on Instagram. Hit me up, direct message, whatever, um, or my website, philwhitebooks.com. And if it's a medical question or a technical question, I will pass it on to Dr. Frank Merritt and he'll do his best to uh, to answer that because he's your guy. I'm not. I'm just the words guy in the middle. And if somebody's looking to pick up the 17-hour fast or any of your other books, where can they find them? Yeah, Um 17 hour fast is, is exclusively on Amazon. We self published that. Um, so yeah, check it out on print on demand. And actually, if you want a Kindle version, that's coming. Um, I would say within the next three months. And we're also, uh, you're the first person I'm telling this about publicly. We are also going to do a quick guide for the 17 hour fast, which nice. don't buy it if you've already bought it. Cause I don't want angry emails through my website. It's, uh, yeah. it's just for those people that either don't typically read a lot of books don't really want to know the story behind why we're doing this, which is, again, to honor my father-in-law's legacy and, and Frank's friend's legacy and to continue the promise that Frank made to him to use this intel to help other people. But yeah, that aside, um, so that book's only on, only on Amazon, Kindle and Quick Guide following this year. And then, yeah, the rest, I mean, if you... If you can buy them for an indie bookstore, support your local indie bookstore. They can order it in if it isn't on the shelves. Um, all my other books, basically. Um, if not, try Barnes and Noble, and worst worst case, go to Amazon. Find find the uh, find the uh, hardbacks, the the Kindle, the, some of them the audio book. So yeah, I'd appreciate it. So what's next for you? What's your next topic? I am working on a book that I can't say too much about with a UFC fighter, but he has some really good stories. Perfect. And I'm I'm also working with Dr. Jim Aframau, who is the the creator of the Champions Mind app and the author of the book of the same name. So kind of a seminal sports psychology book that he wrote some years ago. And um, we're we're working on a book together that um, should hopefully be out late this year or early 2021. We'll definitely take a look for those books in the upcoming months. Phil, once again, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. Really appreciate your thoughtful questions and your time. Thanks, guys, for listening. Please share this podcast and make sure you subscribed because a bunch of you are listening. Haven't passed it on to your friends. Find me on social media at Mike Clark Life on all major platforms or visit MikeClarkLife.com.